Today we are looking at the Radeon R7 360 no scope. I mean, graphics card. I wanted to take a quick look at some noise, power draw, temps, and performance of this old part because on paper, it actually does match the Steam Deck with 1.6 teraflops of theoretical performance. Now I've said it before and I'll say it again, teraflops are not an accurate measurement of gaming performance between architectures. So I don't feel like this being GCN based will hold a torch to our RDNA cards. But what is nice about it is if I run all of my benchmarks at 800p, I already have a video showing what RDNA 1 will do at 1.6 teraflops, so you can come to your own conclusions. And get subscribed so you don't miss out how horrifyingly wrong we are about our Steam Deck predictions when we finally get one. Anyway, back to the card. Before I load this thing up, I'm going to go ahead and take it apart and clean it up. There's no justice benching this thing with six-year-old thermal paste, even if it is a fairly low power part. So here it is. This is, again, a Radeon R7 360. This one so happens to be a MSI OC edition. It was removed from one of my dad's uh, old iBuy powers when its uh, 6600K died. So we salvaged the main board and the GPU out of it. This was a uh, mid-range graphics card from uh, 2015. It was meant to compete with the uh, NVIDIA 750 or uh, 750 Ti that came out almost a year before it. It wasn't necessarily faster, but it was cheaper at uh, $109 uh, MSRP or uh, $10 cheaper than a 750 or $50 cheaper than the 950 that came out a few months after it. With two gigabytes of GDDR5 on a 128 bit bus, it has about twice that of the 750 and the same as the 950. Wow, this thing is actually really not uh, being held on there that much. Honestly, this thermal paste doesn't feel that bad. I wonder if I replaced it before. By today's standards, with uh, 768 shaders at a base clock of one gigahertz, it's about 10% faster than integrated Vega 11 graphics in a uh, 3400G, or 10% faster than, say, a GT 1030. Although this specific 360 can boost up to uh, 1.1 gigahertz, so it might be a little bit faster than that. The funniest thing about all of this is because we're in a GPU shortage, some of these are actually going on eBay for more now than they did new, with uh, them hovering at about 100 to $120, which is uh, about the same as the, uh, the GT 1030. So I personally don't think it's worth anywhere near that much, but uh, such is life. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, this thermal paste doesn't look too bad. Maybe I did replace it. Being that it's a Pirate Islands uh, GCN card, it does have DirectX 12 support. So you can currently play any title you throw at it, but uh, the driver support was dropped a few months ago, meaning that it might start running into some driver requirement issues in the next few years on uh, newer titles. For IO, it has one DVI, one HDMI, and one display port. Unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for me, even though it does have a DisplayPort 1.2, my Valve Index doesn't actually work with it. Not that this would be a good VR card to begin with. It can, however, output 144Hz to the desktop, so if that's something you're into, it, it can do it, but most games won't be able to hold that kind of frame rate, at least at 1080p. And uh, as we saw from the Steam Deck video, maybe not even 800p. It's probably not worth pairing this with anything over a, uh, a 60Hz monitor. For power, there's a single 6-pin PCIe connector for its uh, relatively light 100-watt uh, TDP. You only need like a 300-watt power supply for one of these things. From what I can tell, there is like no cooling on any of the, uh, the VRMs or VRAM, but uh, honestly, with the level of performance this card is operating at, you, you really don't need to worry about it. That's, nothing's going to overheat on this card. The cooling solution is obviously just a block of aluminum with some fins cutting it. It's not very much going on there. The fan appears to be about 90 millimeters. It is, uh, here's a part number in case you were looking for something like this. It has a hell of a, a rattle on startup, so hopefully cleaning up the fan blades will uh, cure any kind of imbalances this poor thing has. Now that we're all cleaned up, the, uh, the fan wire does feed through this little hole here drops right in place. Now this fan shroud is actually a pretty good design because of how it comes down on the edges here. It blocks any outward airflow that the fan might have. So all of the air has to go through these fins, which is, you know, a pretty good design, especially if you're just, you know, trying to cool something really lightweight like this. Now you could get this uh, backwards if you were uh, not paying too much attention. You want to make sure that the cooling solution goes like that, 
and then the MSI logo is on the, uh, the bottom left corner there. So then we can just insert it into the shroud and put all the screws back in. Now that we have the cooling solution back on the, uh, the fan assembly, just go ahead and plug back in the fan and just drop the cooling solution on, making sure not to crush your fan wire. Now this is a very simple GPU to put together. Obviously there's only four screws on the back here, but uh, you want to be careful not to uh, let the screw jump out, jump off, and then you like end up stabbing one of these surface mount components and knocking it off. So just always be careful and aware of that. You're going to put pressure on it. Don't put too terribly much pressure on these. Now that we have it all cleaned up and put back together, let's go ahead and run some noise power and thermals and then get into the benchmarks. All right, so let's just go ahead and run Fermark, see where our temperatures get up to and uh, what kind of noise this thing creates at its uh, max temperature. So it already looks like the, uh, the TDP is a lie. Um, the, uh, the card by itself is pulling uh, 150 watts, so about 50% more than uh, the specification is, but TDPs are all lies anyway. All right, so it appears that its temp target is about 71 degrees C, running the fans at... 2600 RPM. Uh, I measured the fan at about 60 decibels. It's not too terribly loud, especially if this thing was in a case, you probably wouldn't really hear it. Under boost, it gets up to about 150 watts, but when it starts slowing down to uh, limit temperatures, it gets down to about 130 something. So again, it's like 30 to 50% more than stock, which is pretty impressive. <laughs> See if there's any kind of uh, overclocking headroom. Wow, so it actually does appear to let it run at uh, 1200 megahertz, which is, uh, you know, 20% overclock. Looks pretty, uh, it looks like it's starting to uh, artifact a bit. So clearly I don't think that this overclock would be stable long term. Yeah, I think I'll leave it alone at uh, 1100 megahertz. I'm just going to go ahead and reset it back to stock. For the benchmarks, I want to run them all at 800p because I already ran our 5500 XT at 1.6 teraflops and... I know how that performs, so I want to get a better idea of how this performs versus that. So in Beam, it looks like it performs pretty much the same as our uh, our pseudo Steam Deck. It looks like, you know, I think we were getting about this level of uh, FPS, if not pretty close. I think before we might have been hovering closer to, uh, to 60, but uh, overall this doesn't look too terribly bad. Let's go ahead and run Cyberpunk now for this. I'm going to go ahead and adjust the uh, Windows performance options here for uh, the best performance because I know that Windows kind of chews up a little bit of VRAM and uh, this card needs all the VRAM that it can get. So in Cyberpunk at 800p, it's only pushing about 30 FPS, which is a, a solid 10 less than what we were getting with our RDNA 1 card. The game's not unplayable, but I certainly wouldn't really want to play it like this. Let's go ahead and boot up uh, Doom Eternal. Now Doom Eternal doesn't actually let you set certain settings unless you have enough VRAM. So with the settings that I'm running right now, it should need four gigabytes of VRAM, but this card obviously only has two gigabytes. So it's just gonna have to make do with what it's got. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I feel like this play is pretty much the same as our uh, as our pseudo Steam Deck. Let's go ahead and run some uh, built-in benchmarks like uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. So in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, running at 800p, all high settings. We see uh, 38 FPS average, which I believe we saw 45 before or 44, somewhere in there. Anyway, let's go ahead and see what it looks like in Metro Exodus. In Metro Exodus, this thing got absolutely bodied with only 42 FPS average. For reference, our 5500 XT running at 1.6 flops, uh, 61 FPS average, so a pretty huge 50% uh, almost gain there from RDNA 1. All right, let's uh, try out some uh, Red Dead Redemption 2. Honestly, the game doesn't play all that worse on the, uh, the, the 360 here. From what I can tell, it might have a, a few FPS less than the, uh, the 5500 XT, but uh, honestly, this game is really optimized. So there it is, the Radeon R7 360, or as I like to call it, the not really a Steam Deck. Honestly, I'm really surprised by how well this thing performed, given that 
it is so very different than the RDNA RX 5500 XT here. Now, something I didn't really touch on that much in this video is performance per watt. This card draws 150 watts. The 5500 XT here draws 35 watts. So at a fifth of the wattage, you know, roughly, it is able to do 100% or more than this old GCN card. So it's really a no-brainer to think of how much AMD has improved in the last five years. Another thing I failed to touch on in this video is Fidelity FX Super Resolution, which can really breathe new life into these old graphics cards that have, you know, limited video memory and are, you know, overall not that powerful. This card on an FSR title, if you turn it to performance mode, you can see over 50% more FPS. Like you can go from having 60 FPS to 90 FPS. So it's a huge benefit to old cards like this to have that technology. And really GCN was just a general workload architecture. It wasn't meant specifically for gaming or specifically for production where RDNA is really meant for gaming. That's why consoles use it. It's, it's a more dedicated gaming architecture. So obviously it's gonna do better in gaming. And that's where I think that the Steam Deck is really gonna shine because if we saw massive performance per watt increases in just the last few years, RDNA 1 to RDNA 2 should still be really good even if the Steam Deck doesn't have the Infinity Cache that really makes RDNA 2 great. But I really can't wait to see how awesome it performs. Anyway, if you like this video, go ahead and leave us a like. Leave a comment on you know, what you would use this old card for. Get subscribed for you know, future GPU reviews. And like always, I'll see you next time.